Good morning, everybody. Um, great to be here today. This is the Wexner Medical Center's uh, Facebook live stream. Uh, my name is Dr. David Cohn. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of the James Cancer Hospital here at Ohio State in Columbus, Ohio, and I appreciate everybody joining uh, me today. The topic that we're going to be discussing today is cancer and COVID-19, everything that, uh, that you need to know. My plan is to speak for about five minutes and then open this up for any questions that come. So please keep those questions uh, coming. And I hope this is going to be something that's informational and educational for everybody. I would imagine that everybody on this uh, on the stream right now has heard of COVID-19. Um, this is a virus that has started at the end of 2019, uh, initially in China, and has now turned into and caused a global pandemic. Um, I would imagine that everybody has, um, you know, read the news and been involved in discussions of the effect of this virus on our communities. Uh, I wanna give a little bit of basic background of COVID-19 for those that may not know, um, and then we'll talk more in detail about how COVID-19 and cancer um, play a role. So COVID-19 is a virus uh, called coronavirus, and this coronavirus has been around for a long time, but this is a novel strain of coronavirus that uh, nobody has had immunity to prior to this infection of COVID-19. And so that's why this is causing such a, a major pandemic across the world. After the exposure to an, an individual who has COVID-19, it takes about two to 14 days to begin experiencing symptoms. And I just wanna go over some of those typical symptoms. Um, patients that have been infected with COVID-19 may experience a low grade fever of 100 degrees or more. Uh, a dry cough is typically present and also individuals can have shortness of breath, and this can be pretty profound. And one of the most serious complications is breathing complications in individuals that are infected with COVID-19. What's really fascinating is that uh, many patients that have COVID-19 infection actually have no symptoms at all. And these are the so-called asymptomatic carriers of the infection. And it's that group of patients or individuals that can actually infect others without even knowing uh, that they carry the risk of doing so. But if you look across the country, uh, it seems that about one in four individuals who are infected with COVID-19 require some level of hospitalization. There's about 7% of individuals who have COVID infection that require some level of care that includes the intensive care unit because they become critically ill. And it seems that the death rate is estimated anywhere between less than 1% to up to 3%. And these numbers are quite variable because we actually don't know how many people have COVID-19 across the country because we're not testing people routinely at this point in time. So we don't know what that denominator is. We only know those individuals who get tested who then end up dying. And so if we were testing everybody, it's anticipated that the death rate may be on the lower side. Just important facts to remember. So let's talk briefly about cancer. Um, what we know about cancer is that cancer is a disease that affects the immune system. And so cancer seems to be what we call immunosuppressive, which means that it kind of cools off the immune system a little bit. Um, and so it, um, it, it causes people to be more susceptible to certain infections, including viral infections like COVID-19. And we'll talk about that in a quick second. And I think the other important thing to note is that cancer treatment in and of itself also decreases the immune system's capacity to fight off infection. So chemotherapy and radiation therapy, uh, as well as the cancer itself, are also suppressants of the immune system. And the reason why that's important is that the immune system is really important to fight off viruses. And so when we have a patient who has cancer uh, and somebody who has cancer treatment like chemotherapy or radiation, their immune system is decreased to the point where they're not able to fight off viruses quite as effectively as individuals who don't have cancer or who don't have cancer treatment. And that's why this intersection between COVID-19 and cancer and cancer patients is so critically important to understand because our patients who have cancer are at increased susceptibility to develop COVID-19 infection. And likewise, individuals who develop COVID-19 infection also are at higher risk for having major complications like the intensive care unit evaluations and even death from COVID-19 itself. And so the message that I wanna to bring today is just to make sure that we understand that individuals with cancer are at a higher risk for developing COVID-19 and at a higher risk for complications from COVID-19. And that leads to the ultimate necessity of making sure that we're doing everything that we can to minimize the chance of infection. 
And so we'll talk at the end just about the importance of making sure that we're in a position to try to fight off um, the, the spread of COVID-19. Let's talk first about cancer treatment. Um, so I, I wanna mention that you know, individuals who are currently undergoing cancer treatment right now in this era of COVID, it's just critically important to begin having a conversation with your oncologist. So in general, uh, cancer treatments that are ongoing prior to COVID-19 are continuing after COVID-19. And so there's a lot of conversations about elective surgeries being canceled across the country, as has been recommended by the US Surgeon General. These things are true, but very often cancer treatments are not elective. So cancer surgeries generally are not elective, so these are not being canceled. And likewise, chemotherapy treatments that are necessary to improve a patient's survival or to improve their quality of life or maintain their good quality of life are continuing to be ongoing. Radiation therapy for patients that, um, that are ongoing also will continue to happen at this point in time. And so that's a really important thing to note is that while there's all this discussion about, you know, how critical things are at hospitals, um, that may be true in certain settings, but it's really important to note that necessary cancer treatments are ongoing. Have a conversation with your oncologist or your primary care provider. Make sure that you understand what this means for you at your individual clinic or your individual hospital so that your doctors and your care providers can give you that information that's relative to, to yourself. Um, there are some things that are different, and I think that we've recognized that there's a whole lot of emphasis today now on trying to figure out which type of visits we can do virtually, which means by telephone or via video conference. So a lot of the face-to-face -face interactions that we would have with our cancer patients, if they're not absolutely necessary to be done face-to-face, -face, at this point in time, we tend to be doing these now by video or by telephone. And the reason for this is that I kind of think about it that the goal of a cancer patient or the goal of anybody is to try to maximally control your environment. So this gets back to what can we do individually to protect our communities from the spread of coronavirus or getting ourselves in a position to not be infected with COVID-19. And so what I say is that um, everything that's been discussed from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, about the importance of hand washing, um, meaning you need to wash your hands whenever uh, whenever you can, whenever you touch something, that's really key. Use hand sanitizer when you don't have soap and water around you. Social distancing or physical distancing is really important as well. Making sure that you keep that barrier of six to 10 feet around yourself to minimize the chance that you're gonna have somebody who might have COVID-19 infection infect you. These are all things that we can do to control our environment. And likewise, if you're a cancer patient, you might find that your, your care team is gonna help you to control that environment by decreasing your requirement to come into the clinic for a follow-up visit. They might recommend that rather than come in for examination uh, prior to chemotherapy infusion, you might go right up to chemotherapy and have an examination there. It just minimizes the chance that you're gonna be around individuals who could be infected, controlling your environment, maximizing the chance that you're gonna continue through this without becoming infected with COVID-19 because the fewer individuals who are affected, the fewer the impact of the rest of the community and the less impact there's gonna be on hospitals as well. But I think most importantly, again, cancer treatments that are necessary are gonna continue and we need to do whatever we can to control our environment. Um, the last point I wanna make is just about uh, physical distancing. And I think that you know, cancer is a condition that's very challenging uh, physically, very challenging emotionally as well. And a lot of cancer patients express kind of isolation, social isolation they may be experiencing, and then physical isolation because they are, again, their immune systems might be down to the point where they're not able to interact. You then layer on top of that COVID-19 infection, which again has, you know, a lot of fear associated with it like cancer. And there's a lot of physical isolation that we now have to undergo. And when you combine the, you know, the fear of cancer and the fear of COVID-19, the physical and the social isolation as well, we have to remember that you know, for the patients out there who have cancer, um, we need to make sure that we focus on wellness, uh, focus on mindfulness as well. Keeping those social connections whenever you can is just so critically important as we're getting through this COVID-19 pandemic. We'll get out of this on the other side, we'll look back and, um, and reflect upon how hard this was, but whatever we can do at this point in time to kind of maintain the positive attitude, 
to make those social connections, um, you know, hang out as you can on video chats and the phone with friends and family. These are really the keys to success of getting through this, not just from the treatment of cancer, but also the treatment of ourselves. Um, and so with that, I'd like to open it up for some questions. I'm gonna look over to the side here and see what we've got. Um, and I may not get through everybody's questions here and I appreciate all the, um, all the positive feedback I've received already. We'll certainly get to a point of trying to address these questions either live uh, or in the future. So there's a question um, about liver disease. And so, you know, what about liver disease and COVID-19? I, I would say that um, individuals that have medical complications like cancer, like liver disease, like heart conditions as well, are all at a higher risk for developing complications related to COVID-19. And so this is a really important point that there are certain groups that are at higher risks for having complications or even dying from COVID-19. It is the seeming the older population is at higher risk and individuals that have other you know, concurrent conditions of other things like liver, kidney, uh, kidney disease uh, and cancers included in that group as well. So just the emphasis on controlling your environment, um, maintaining that social physical distance and then hand washing whenever you can. The CDC, as you know, or maybe know, has also recommended that the general population also consider wearing masks. And I would refer you to the CDC's website for information on, uh, on the current guidelines, but also on information about how to make masks as well. The Surgeon General's got a YouTube video out there as well uh, about how to make a mask at home. These are very helpful topics. So there's a question about how much do we know about patients who are in remission, but who've had chemotherapy in the past year? And that's a really great question that um, we don't have great answers to. So I would kind of phrase it this way. After chemotherapy is done, what's the timeline until the immune system is back up to someone who, has a, who hasn't had cancer treatment in the past? So when is your risk for developing COVID or complications from COVID identical to that of the general population? At this point in time, we're not entirely sure, uh, but in general, once your blood counts have recovered, which might be a month or two after standard chemotherapy, longer if there's higher doses of chemotherapy or bone marrow transplantation, the immune systems are generally back to normal and you could have a normal risk for developing COVID or complications from COVID. But I would certainly refer you back to your oncologist about those specific scenarios to see whether or not your immune system is back to normal. But what I would say is that independent of whether your immune system is normal or not, everything that we talked about in terms of hand hygiene, physical distancing and controlling one's environment still are relevant, whether your immune system is normal or is not normal as well. And there's another question about, you know, a cancer survivor of less than 18 months, is their immune system weakened? And another one about kidney disease and dialysis. I would say that that's, again, the same exact scenario is that dialysis is another condition that if there's kidney failure, the chance of having complications from COVID-19 is higher. So be safe out there, minimize the need to be out of the house. Uh, if you don't need to be out of the house, you can have people shop for you, uh, wear a mask in the community as the CDC is recommended as well. I think is a really important uh, an important topic. So I'd like to address a question here uh, that's about stem cell transplantation and a blood draw uh, and showering as well. And so there's uh, three parts to, three parts to this question, and that is that number one, um, blood draws are still ongoing if they're necessary. Sometimes routine blood draws are done where the value of the information might be really limited at this time, and it might be thought that the risk for exposing someone to the population might be higher than the benefit of getting that blood draw. So we might actually say at certain times, you don't need a blood draw this week or this month, but that's something you talk to your doctor about. And then in terms of showering when somebody gets home, this is a really common question. Um, it, we know that the virus can, you know, can, can occur on clothing, but it seems that from what we know now that the rate of infection of those virus particles on clothing is very low. So wash your hands. That's the most common way that you can get the virus is getting from your hand to your face. Um, wash your hands. You know, many people choose to change their clothing when they get into the house and wash their clothes if there's been a high risk exposure uh, for healthcare providers. But short of that, I don't believe that there's a necessity to shower or to change one's clothes as soon as you come into the house after getting a blood draw or something like that. Um, there's a question about oral chemotherapy, so a chemotherapy pill and whether the same things we've talked about are, are relevant. And the answer to that is yes. So any type of chemotherapy, whether it's intravenous or whether it's oral, they both carry the same type of risk to decreasing the immune system. 
So same exact thing, talk to your doc uh, or your healthcare provider about that, but also make sure to do those things of social, physical distancing, hand washing, wear a mask if you're out as well, um, traditional things that we've talked about. I sound like a broken record saying it over and over again, but that's really the most important thing we can do. And the last question that I'm going to address is uh, that about plasma and blood, uh, whether that's a treatment for individuals who have COVID. Um, this is a really interesting thing I'd like everybody to keep their eyes on at this point in time. There's a lot of research on prevention of COVID in the future, the COVID vaccine. But now there's also discussions about what can we do to improve the outcome of patients that have COVID-19. So we know that individuals with other diseases who have had infection develop antibodies or immunity to that virus. And so if you take their blood and you sterilize it, and then you re-inject it into a patient who's at risk for developing COVID or has it, is that something that's gonna passively immunize our patients to keep them from either getting COVID or to improve their chances of survival? There's a clinical trial or a study that just started recently, and um, hopefully we'll hear more about this. There's a ton of research that's ongoing in COVID. I think that the scientific community is rallying uh, to try to get around this as quickly as we can. And um, it's, it's a very important component that will hopefully improve the outcome of our patients in the near future. So with that, I'm gonna um, close this session. I appreciate everybody's watching. I apologize I couldn't get to all the questions. The hope is we'll do this again. Um, be well, be safe out there, wash your hands, physical distance from others, and, um, and be well. Thank you for watching.